Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 1st of October 2020 today. These webinars are hosted by my colleague and friend Sebastian Geiger at Heriot Watt University and myself from TU Delft. We are especially grateful to our keynote speakers who have supported this initiative and to you all for joining us in combat work from home isolation. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, which has uh, received more than 1,300 subscribers by now. It would allow you access the past uh, lectures as well as getting notifications for the upcoming ones. Uh, also, there is a Tea Time talk series uh, that is run by uh, mostly junior researchers uh, for you all. Um, and please uh, do attend, subscribe to their channel, and also volunteer to present a talk in their series as well. Now to the lecture of this week. It's our pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Majid Hassanizadeh, is our keynote speaker of this week. Uh, Majid wouldn't need my introduction, really, uh, but I would still uh, read a few lines about him. Uh, Majid is Emeritus Professor of Hydrogeology at the Faculty of Geosciences of Utrecht University in Netherlands. He holds BSc, Bachelor of Science from University of Shiraz, Pahlavi University of Shiraz in Iran, and Master of Sciences and PhD from Princeton University in USA, all in civil engineering. After his PhD, he became assistant professor at Abadan Institute of Technology for almost three years, then joins a consulting engineering company for about two years, and then joins the Technical and Engineering University of Tehran as adjunct assistant professor. He then moves to the Netherlands, where he became senior researcher with the National Institute of Public Health and Environment, RIVM, between 84, 1984 and 95. And this institute is quite an important institute these days due to the pandemic. They, they report the, the official health uh, situation as well. And then after that, he became adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Geology of Utrecht University and then was promoted to associate professor as well. In 2001, he became professor in the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences of TU Delft, Delft University of Technology, where I work actually today. In 2004, he joins back Utrecht University and uh, stays there until now. Majid was the editor of Advances in Water Resources journal between 91 to 2001. He is now on the editorial boards of Transporting Poros Media since 1989, Journal of Poros Media since 2009, Special Topics and Reviews in Poros Media and International Journal since 2010, and member of International Advisory Board of Journal of Hydrologic Engineering since 2004. He's a member of American Geophysical Union, American Association, for Advancement of Science, Soil Science Society of America, European Geophysical Union, International Association of Hydrological Sciences, and U.S. National Groundwater Association. He co-founded the International Society for Poros Media, Interpor, in 2008. Uh, we all, three of us, Sebastian, myself, and Majid, all are uh, quite active uh, members of Interpor, so that's quite uh, uh, a home for us as well, and has been managing director of Interpol Society also since its establishment. Uh, he has organized many conferences, workshops, and short courses, and has been invited and keynote speaker of many, many international events. He has received a number of awards, uh, including the elected fellow of American Geophysical Union, elected fellow of American Association for Advancement of Science, also, he received honorary doctorate degree from Stuttgart University in 2008. And he's a recipient of uh, von Humboldt Prize in 2010, recipient receiver of Don and Betty Kirkham Soil Physics Award, selected as 2012 Darcy Lecturer by the U.S. National Groundwater Association. And also, he has been awarded a research grant, uh, a Euro uh, a European uh, grant, uh, ERC Advanced, which is quite a competitive and, and quite a prestigious uh, uh, award in Europe. He's receiving a, re a receiver of the Royal Medal of Honor of the Netherlands, uh, reader in the Order van Nederlandse Leeuwen, which is Knight in the Order of 
Netherlands Lion. It's a royal honor. And in July uh, 2015, he received that. Also, he received Robert uh, E. Horton Medal from American Geophysical Union just last year. That's also quite a prestigious uh, award. Uh, we can't really do justice to introduce him. Uh, we all owe him a lot in, in uh, the scientific community of Poros Media. He's done a lot to the community, to many people uh, that I know. Uh, we uh, owe him a lot for what we have. And it's our uh, real pleasure and honor to host you, Majid, this week. Thank you for graciously accepting our invitation. And to the audience, please note uh, Majid's lecture will last for about uh, half an hour, 30 minutes and then followed by questions and discussions. And like before, please type your questions in the chat box and Sebastian will share a lively discussion after Majid's lecture. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, please also note that do not wait until the end of the lecture. Whenever you feel appropriate, please do text your question because it may also trigger other questions. Uh, without any further ado, uh, I would like to give the bandwidth, the screen, the stage to Majid. Thanks once more uh, and please. Thank you so much, Hadi. Such a a very generous uh, introduction. Thank you. And also thank you to Sebastian for organizing this. Um, and uh, thank you to all who are uh, attending online. <clears throat> I'll talk about methane leakage from abandoned gas wells in the Netherlands to give a picture of what the situation is and what are the potential uh, issues that are involved. This was a research that was done basically by Gillian Schout uh, who was our PhD student, uh, to, uh, the other advisor were Jasper Griffiun and Niels Hartog, and he graduated uh, and defended last July. The thesis, uh, the title of the thesis is given down there. Um, so it's been mainly his work. Uh, we are just supervising, really not doing much, enjoying it. Uh, so I'll give an introduction and talk about the occurrence of META in the Netherlands. We did a uh, wide nationwide study of methane concentration distribution. Then there was soil and gas, uh, soil gas measurements around a number of abandoned wells, and then some numerical simulation of the uh, a, a typical situation. Um, so methane uh, can be uh, found, can have two different origins. It could be biogenic, which is the product of breakdown of organic matter. It happens in the subsurface at temperatures up to 75 degrees, usually lower temperatures, say 50 degrees, 40 degrees, and happens under anoxic conditions. And archaea and bacteria degrade the organic matter and produce methane. <clears throat> but it could be thermogenic, produced deep down <clears throat> in the uh, Earth's uh, subsurface. Uh, temperatures uh, usually higher than 150 degrees, and it's uh, produced by metagenic, uh, methanogenic breakdown of organic matter, and uh, by it's a part of a thermocatalytic, catalytic uh, natural gas generation. It's a cracking operation, basically, process. Um, so it's important to know if you encounter methane, is it biogenic or is it thermogenic? Uh, because that also relates to the cause of having such leakage uh, and such occurrence. How to determine that? One can do that, uh, at least in theory, based on the molecular and isotopic composition of the gases that contain that methane. Uh, and they have been dissolved in groundwater. Uh, the theory is that... Uh, the biogenic uh, methane, so here we are plotting depth against the uh, uh, isotope uh, carbon-13. Uh, uh, and uh, the theory is that at uh, small depth, uh, so actually around, say, 50 meters or so, and lower temperatures, uh, we have this microbial generation of uh, methane. Eh? This is the biogenic methane. You see that there is a shaded coloring of green. That means that it really happens more around here, but can also happen here. Depends on the availability of bacteria and the organic matter and so other conditions. And then the thermogenic happens at uh, much uh, higher uh, say the lower carbon content, uh, carbon the 13 content, that means larger uh, 
carbon, hydrocarbon uh, alkane chains, and it happens at temperatures of 100, yeah, above 100, mainly actually deep down there, and therefore depths of four to five kilometers. So if we really find methane and we uh, analyze it and see that the composition is more around here than here, then we can say, oh, it's biogenic and not thermogenic. Of course, it's not that simple. This is the theory because what happens if you find methane in some uh, uh, shallow depth, it could have come from deep down there because of the migration. Or it could be that it has this composition, uh, say uh, less uh, carbon-13, because the biogenic methane was oxidized under, uh, under oxy conditions, and therefore some of the lighter hydrocarbon were degraded and therefore the heavier one remains. So it's not always the case, but at least this is the uh, indication and uh, a tool in order to find out the origin. Uh, why would we have methane leakage? No, it could be a natural cause. Methane seeping simply through permeable layers or via fissures and fractures and cracks and fouls on coming up. Or it could be uh, because of uh, uh, human being uh, intervention and actions. Uh, that can be uh, through wells that we bore down there and boreholes. And also we can induce fractures for example, during the uh, shale oil production or shale gas production, you can induce fractures. And then the, the casings of these oil and gas boreholes could be leaking. Uh, regarding that part, you know, the casings uh, of boreholes for gas and oil are actually a number of uh, casing uh, strings um, shown here. Uh, there are areas of weakness. Eh? There is here, for example, a packer that really separates the reservoir from the upper parts. So if there is any uh, uh, in, uh, insufficient uh, um, um, packing here, uh, then uh, if there are any imperfections, let's say, then you can have leakage here. You can also have leakages here and here where these new, uh, say, the other series of casings start. So also when they abandon the well, they usually cut off the upper part of it uh, up to three meters approximately below the land surface. And then they cap the upper part of the casings. Uh, they, of course, before that, they put cement into these uh, weaker areas I mentioned. So the idea is that this will be completely uh, 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 covered uh, such that no gas can escape. But of course, this cement can be, its quality can be compromised because of various environmental uh, interactions or simply it wasn't good from the beginning. And therefore, we can have leakage. And then uh, the, the, also another thing can happen, as shown here, uh, because of movement of the uh, subsurface. You can have shear occur, and then in, along a shear zone shown here, then you can have damage to the casing and again cause uh, leakage from the borehole. Now, why should we worry about methane leakage? Well, first of all, if it uh, reaches our groundwater resources, it degrades the quality. Uh, methane is not really uh, uh, poisonous, and when you put poor water comes out of the tap or you put it into glass, methane mainly escapes. Uh, and it's also odorless and tasteless, so you don't really bother. But nevertheless, you don't want methane to be in the groundwater that is meant for um, uh, drinking. It's a kind of contamination. Uh, then there is also the fact that if methane reaches the atmosphere, it's a greenhouse and a very uh, high, highly potent, say, put the potential uh, uh, for uh, the uh, the greenhouse effect is even larger than CO2, as you know. Um, but more importantly, there is explosion hazard because especially when you have buildings, then the gas can accumulate under the buildings, in the basements, and in crawl spaces, 
and uh, other confined, confined areas, and that can result in explosion. And it has, this has happened uh, now in various places around the world in the past. So this is something actually to worry about quite a lot. Um, now, in the Netherlands, it's interesting to know that uh, since late 19th century, natural gas was produced from groundwater on a small scale by farmers in some polder areas of the Netherlands. And uh, this was the groundwater that they produced contained a large amounts of dissolved gas, dissolved under uh, higher pressure. And this gas, they could, they could degas the groundwater and then use the gas that was produced and was used for lighting and for cooking. It wasn't a huge amount, but it was fine at those times, especially at the, uh, as the, there was lack of other uh, uh, fuels. Uh, here is a, a sketch of the groundwater gas production installation. So from deep down here, uh, the uh, 30 to 50 meters uh, deep, there was water containing methane. This was biogenic methane. And then they would produce it. It would usually come up by its own pressure. And then they, was a sort of a sprinkler si uh, system under a tank, uh, the, so the tank shown here, where uh, the, would they sprinkle the water, the gas would escape, uh, go under there, and the water would be taken to a ditch, another uh, tank where any remaining gas would also escape, and then the gas would be either used uh, for consumption or would be stored here in this tank for later consumption. And here is a photo of a such a system, an old one from early 1900. Uh, there is a website here with more information about that. Um, now, uh, th there has been, of course, also production of gas and oil in the Netherlands. It started in the uh, 1940s, and uh, there are currently uh, about 4,500 onshore boreholes in the Netherlands. As I said, they started early, actually the early, uh, um, earlier boreholes, uh, that's shown here in the map. You see up here, uh, you see up here the year appearing, and then there are different kinds of boreholes. Uh, let me stop it uh, for a minute. Uh, how do you do that? No, um, there were mainly, uh, uh, boreholes for coal down here, and then yellow is boreholes that were in, related to salt, and then later on boreholes for gas and oil, and there was also later on uh, in recent years geothermal boreholes. So there are all these boreholes, and there is actually not sufficient information about the status of these boreholes, especially those which are abandoned and could be leaking. So one part of the study we did was to uh, collect data about uh, concentration of methane in groundwater wells and or in wells, no, sorry, not only groundwater or wells. And these were samples that have been collected over many, many years by various uh, agencies. And there are various archives for these samples. So this was a sort of data mining operation uh, more than 12,000 uh, values were found from uh, more than 2,000 well locations. They were all collected and analyzed. This was only concentration of methane. And these were uh, shown in the map all over the country. And these were uh, the areas where there were also gas and oil. And the idea was, can we find a correlation between uh, this methane in that uh, groundwater and the gas reservoir or oil reservoirs that were around it. In addition to that, uh, we did uh, ourselves, Khilion did this, sampling of the groundwater in various locations. And this were from geothermal wells, six wells, deep ones, 1,600 to 2,600 meters deep below land surface, from deep wells up to 870 meters deep, and from 17 shallow wells, up to 280 meters deep. And those are actually shown also here in uh, 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 triangles uh, around here. Um, 
now these are all reported in the uh, paper that actually is going to be submitted by Hilian. Here are the results shown over depth, the number of data for that particular depth. So these are the number of data, the maximum concentration, the minimum concentration is somewhere here, and then the median concentration. And you see that actually the maximum concentration were depth of about 20 to 50 meter, and the largest median concentrations were at the depth of about 70 to 100 meters. And uh, so there were comparatively large number of samples with more than one milligram per liter, 30% of the samples, or even 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, for comparison, you should know that the solubility of methane in water under normal conditions uh, is about 30 uh, gram, milligrams per liter. So these are still below solubility. However, at some locations there were uh, uh, locally concentration uh, close to solubility or even higher. The largest was 120 milligram per liter. Of course, at lower, uh, bigger depth, you can dissolve more. Um, so, yeah, as I said, the highest concentration is those depths, and the methane concentration are especially elevated in glacial deposits in the mainly eastern part of the country. And you can see here the plot of, uh, say, the ratio of a lighter uh, alkane uh, carbon to uh, the isotopic concentration of carbon-13, and uh, the, the, the little circles here are simply gas concentrations from gas samples. And all the other symbols are uh, from our data. Now, we can see that the shallow groundwater is indeed all in biogenic areas. But the other samples in deep ones, they are down here. So it's a mix of, uh, potentially mix of biogenic and, uh, and to thermogenic and mainly actually biogenic is, is hard to say. So we didn't find really a link between shallow groundwater, uh, occurrence of methane in shallow groundwater and their proximity to gas uh, reservoirs. And majority were either biogenic or mixed. And these are all reported in a paper of Hillian. Now then, uh, we had another uh, one, one of the more uh, things, by the way, I didn't mention here is that uh, the uh, samples that we took, we did isotopic concentration, which are shown here. Uh, this uh, map here is not for those 12,000 values. It's only for the values of that we took samples that took ourselves. Um, we also took samples from uh, groundwater uh, boreholes. Uh, these were uh, 29 locations, and these were mainly, uh, we, uh, uh, sorry, these are soil gas measurements. Yeah, so these are not the groundwater. These are the soil gas measurements. What is the concentration of methane in the air phase of the soil? And we did measurements at 29 locations. These were mainly locations that we knew there were cut and buried gas and oil wells. Uh, we had the GPS coordinates, and then we tried to locate them because you cannot see them on the surface in most cases. Uh, so locate them and make measurements around them. Uh, there were uh, 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 three methods we did that, these measurements. I explained that. There were 28 abundant gas wells and one oil wells. Fluxes were calculated based on the temporal change of concentration in the sampling. So i explain in a minute. Uh, and then the measurement went in three, di three different ways. One was to, if this is the location of this red circle, the location of the buried gas uh, well, we don't know, it's down there. We put this uh, uh, here, a wooden cylinder, a rope, it's hard to see it, but there's a rope here, was connected to it, tied to it, and then uh, Hillion was walking, starting from a distance of about uh, 15 meter, was walking on a spiral towards the well. As he was walking, the uh, rope would uh, 
uh, uh, bent around that uh, block of wood. So therefore the rope became shorter and shorter and he was getting closer and closer to the, to the well. As he was walking, he was holding a suction cup and this suction cup has a little pump on it that uh, sucks the uh, gas. And then uh, um, there is a, a gas gasomat, a measuring gas that measures the amount of gas. Uh, of course, when you start, there is almost little gas in there. Let's say there is leakage of CH4, okay? So when you start, there is little gas in it, but as he moves and he's collecting gas in that suction cup, the concentration goes up and up and up. So until he reaches the well. So that means that from the concentration uh, built up in that, you can calculate from DCDT basically times that volume, you can calculate the flux of CH4 coming up. So this was one method. Now, when in most cases, there was very little CH4 beyond background concentrations found. When there was some anomaly, that means higher fluxes were found, then in those places, we use what we call a static chamber to make measurements. And this is static chamber, you put it actually, it's a chamber of 56 centimeter high and 11 centimeter wide. You put it on the soil surface and then there is a pump and you collect the gas in here and you do this for about five minutes and then you, uh, you can measure again the flux. And this was at one, this was done on the well head. So in the middle where the highest concentration were expected. And this was done at 22 locations. Now here is some uh, of the uh, sample of measurements, examples of the measurements. All these points give you data points and the color gives you the concentration. Most colors are again, around the background concentration because this is PPMV, a par par parts per million on volume basis. And in the air, we have about 1.8. Nowadays, it's a little bit more, it's about two. So you see most of them are around background concentration. There are few that are more, but this uh, could be simply local generation from organic matter or peat. But anyway, when there was, for those boreholes that we found extra, uh, larger concentrations, then we measured uh, in one meter deep uh, boreholes. What it means that we uh, dig a borehole of one meter deep, as shown here, and put the uh, static chamber on top of that borehole and made measurements. And so the buried uh, borehole is down there and we made measurements above it, approximately above it. And these, uh, you, the data you can see here, uh, if it was a surface measurement that we just, we put the uh, suction chamber on the surface or we use the suction comp, uh, cup, then there are very few data points you can see here with uh, larger than background concentration. The green is background concentration at that location. We got the background concentration or control concentration at any location by making measurements 15 meters away from the borehole, uh, expected place of the borehole. And you see that there wasn't really much. But when we did this one meter deep measurement, what is interesting, we found very large fluxes in one of the boreholes, this was borehole MN02. And you see, this is logarithmic. So this is very huge flux. And this was, we knew above a, a buried gas uh, well. So this particular one, we did extra measurements because actually they were going to have a housing project here. And this reached the national media that, oh, there is a housing project on a buried gas a borehole and that borehole seems to be leaking. So we did extra uh, measurements there and we found that that borehole is indeed uh, leaking heavily 
and uh, the, the Dutch oil company had to go there and uh, through a expensive and uh, extended operation, try to really uh, eliminate the uh, leakage. What is important to note is that on the for this particular boiler on the surface, we didn't measure anything and it was leaking. And it was only when you went one meter deeper and two meter deep that you could uh, uh, detect it. Another special case I'd like to share with you, and this is a catastrophic underground blowout of a gas well during uh, the bore, uh, uh, boring they did uh, for the gas in that place. This is a place called the Slane in the Netherlands in 1965. Uh, as they were boring, uh, all of the sudden there was a blowout. And here, uh, so I show you a movie which is from a few days after the blowout, and you can still see. Uh, oh, what happened? Uh, hopefully, oh. yeah. And then see you on your head, langzaam maar zeker. So you see that there is huge amount of huge volumes of gas and water and sediment coming out of that borehole and it went on for tens of days. Of course it became less and less, but it was there. And this is what the situation is now uh, that is we cannot see much. So we went there and determined it was a major uh, me measurement campaign. All around that particular site, we made measurements of uh, the concentration of CH4 in the gas, uh, in the soil, as well as in the groundwater. And uh, we did uh, full analysis of those samples. And here I show uh, just one uh, of the results where it shows the concentration of CH4. This is uh, near the well as a function of distance from the blowout. And you see that the uh, concentration in the groundwater samples is almost equal to uh, close to uh, the, the solubility limit. And as you go from away from it, the concentration decreases. So 50 years later, 55 years later, there is still a large concentration. And this was all thermogenic gas. We could establish that beyond doubt is coming from the deep down there. There were still gas around that. So it doesn't go away that easily. This was already reported in another paper of uh, Hillion. Well, how much time do we have? Uh, now, I'm going to be brief with this one. So all of this shows that measurements on the soil surface doesn't really tell you. And if you want to make an estimate of how much CH4 is coming from down, deep down there, yeah, you cannot do a full scale measurement and you also need to do some modeling. And uh, the modeling we did is that a typical situation less, like here, that there is a bore, gas borehole is leaking from deep down there somewhere. This is the groundwater uh, aquifer area, so the shallow aquifer, 30, 40, 50 meters deep. There is a groundwater well in here, and the gas that comes out could potentially reach this groundwater well. Or you can have housing on top of this and gas reach under the houses. So we wanted to model this. So this is the model section, uh, which means that uh, we uh, basically, this is, and it's, by the way, it's a three-dimensional modeling because we have groundwater flow included here uh, from, say, left to right, one-dimensional groundwater flow, but the modeling is three-dimensional. So this is the three-dimensional box. Uh, we have uh, on the left-hand side, and actually on both sides, we have hydrostatic water pressure distribution except that we have a little bit higher than hydrostatic on the left than the right. So this uh, induces groundwater flow. The gas uh, saturation is zero uh, on uh, both ends. Uh, on the top, we, CH4 can go out, so there is free flow. There is no flow of water. And at the bottom, at one corner, so this is where the leakage uh, 
supposedly will be the gas comes in at a given flux so there's a newman boundary condition otherwise all the boundaries are closed to the gas uh, so gas flow is zero also water flow is zero so the gas comes in basically and then we want to know how does this gas distribute here does it stay in here does it reach the land surface in what concentrations so we worked with various gas fluxes uh, with various water velocity and the depth of the base aquifer so how deep this is 60 meter in this uh, drawing but we had also uh, 240 and 480 meters uh, the bold face numbers these are our base case and then we did uh, sensitivity analysis with other values uh, and analyze the data uh, we used uh, the Dumox uh, simulation package, uh, the, uh, which uh, basically is a compositional two-phase flow model. Uh, there is an equation uh, for each uh, dissolve, uh, for each uh, component of each phase. So the gas phase has water and CH4, and the water also has H2O and CH4. So for each of them, we write this equation. This equation will be written twice. Uh, for the, each component and then we have Darcy's law for the uh, each phase this diffusion of the components and of course capillary pressure saturation relationship we assume equilibrium uh, between water and gas ideal gas law for the gas phase and Brooks Corey relationship for capillary pressure and relative permeability we also assume local thermal and chemical equilibrium so uh, the we also varied porous media properties like the D50 of the, the soil, because using this, we determined relative permeability and PCS curves. And so there are, say, coarse grain fluvial sand, hydraulic fill, and clay alluvium. Different anisotropy ratio and the residual gas saturation for the uh, uh, PCS curve and rel perm were also given three different numbers. The gas density and solubility is a function of pressure and temperature so it's a function of depth basically and we use the graph that is shown here i'm not going to go through the table that gives the full set of variation in the parameter values that we did here's an example of the model results these are the initial conditions here is the distribution of uh, gas saturation is zero to start with and this is the water velocity is from left to right the little variation you see here is because of the variation in the pressure on the two sides. Otherwise, it's supposed to be homogeneous, uh, although we also did simulation for heterogeneous cases. And this is the concentration of CH4 in water and the maximum con uh, concentration as a function of maximum uh, concentration of CH4 normalized by maximum concentration. And then uh, what you find you see that here the gas starts to come up uh, for this this is the base case uh, here the uh, where the gas is the groundwater flow is very small uh, it's a 2d cross section but as i said this was three dimensional so this is right above the leakage point and here are the con dissolved ch4 concentration uh, so the gas really in this particular case goes upward but it dissolves in the water and goes laterally with the groundwater. Um, we uh, ch changed, uh, as I said, the flow rate velocity, uh, flow rate of water, the groundwater velocity, and uh, when the groundwater velocity is not zero, because these are stagnant, and then we see that uh, when there, there is flow velocity, that the gas goes more laterally than vertically. Um, and we did this initial concentration of gas in the water. We played with different initial concentration, no gas, and 95% solubility, initial concentration of uh, methane in water. Um, and this is the amount of uh, gas that leaves the surface once again if there is groundwater flow, it very little leaves the surface. So it leaves to the atmosphere. These are uh, changing the, uh, the, the uh, gas 
flux, the leakage flux, uh, different values, and changing the groundwater velocity. And we see that the, say, largest uh, uh, fluxes to the surface or the vertical movement of gas to the surface occurs when there is a large gas flux. Now, of course, we didn't need to simulation to know this, but here you have numbers. And uh, even if there is groundwater flow velocity, still it will reach the land surface. Uh, I think I will, uh, I should end here uh, to give you the time for questions. Uh, so I would like to conclude that the results of our study shows that there is no clear link between shallow groundwater methane occurrence and proximity to oil gas wells in the Netherlands. What's well, not found? There is a spelling error here, sorry. The measurement of methane concentration at the surface is not sufficient to find leaking gas and oil boreholes. You really have to measure deeper and not only concentration, but analyze the composition and especially the isotopic composition. And if there are deep lying gas leakage uh, sources, then large quantities of gas may be retained in the aquifer. I showed you in some cases, uh, according to our numerical simulation, gas doesn't reach the surface, remains in the aquifer. Now, this has positive and negative uh, uh, um, po effects. Uh, it's positive uh, because it reduces the explosion hazard as the gas doesn't reach the land surface, but it also means that the uh, leakage can go unnoticed for a long time. Uh, our, our study also showed that the contribution of methane leakage to greenhouse gas emissions is relatively insignificant. I didn't talk about that. We did uh, some order of magnitude calculations based on the, the borehole we found that was leaking, as I told you, one of the boreholes was leaking and had to be repaired. So from the flux measurements we made, we made there, and that was 3% of all the boreholes we studied. So if we say 3% uh, of the boreholes in the Netherlands are leaking with uh, some average flux. Also, we use our numerical simulation. How much CH4 we reach the environment atmosphere and we find that it's very actually very little it's uh, only a, a very small percentage of the total anthropogenic methane emissions in the netherlands so it's not really that much of an issue in terms of environmental issues okay well thank you very much i hope uh, i was clear and uh, i uh, i'm willing uh, very much interested in your questions Thank you very much, Majid, for this very interesting talk. I see already some questions popping up, and I believe there will be more to come. So uh, I would just give the stage to Sebastian. Yes, thank you very much, Majid. Um, plenty of questions coming in, so I'm going to try and group them and um, read them out. So the first one um, was by Yuan Wang, thanking you for the interesting talk. He has actually two questions. The first one is, was it easy to access the locations and measure the methane concentration? Yeah, it, so not always. Sometimes it was. Sometimes it wasn't because uh, of either uh, uh, private uh, activities that were going on. Uh, many of them were farms uh, uh, or farm, let's say, uh, pasture area. But and then even those are not necessarily easily accessible. Uh, so Gillian really had to get wet and muddy in many, many occasions. Uh, there are nice photos of it. Um, but yeah, it's not. So it's something you really have to be prepared for. Great. Thank you. So I'm staying on the topic of measuring things um, and the data. So Soren Pope. Um, since it's greeting, do you imagine it? Thank you for the inspiring talk. I might have missed it, but how long does a measurement take? Are measurements influenced yeah. by seasons, climate? Um, well, not by seasons and climate. At least we didn't uh, modify our protocol based on that. Uh, the measurements that were with two, 
different types of measurement. One was with the suction cup walking around a borehole. That took about half an hour. And the measurements with a uh, static chamber were pumping uh, water, uh, gas through it. It was about five minutes. And in cases that there was a low concentration measured in order to increase the accuracy or the precision, it took 10 minutes. Okay. So again, lots of questions around how you measure these, these methane concentrations. There are two that are from two different people, they're quite related. Follow up from what um, Son has asked, so Russell and Sophie asked, thank you for a great talk. I was wondering about the effect of environmental conditions, temperature, humidity, wind speed, and others in concentration measurements. Could you please comment? Quite related to this is um, if you see any seasonal variations in CF. CH4 yeah. leakage. So what are the... We didn't really look effect? into that uh, seasonal variations because that would be a really wholly different type of uh, measurement campaign. This was already a huge operation because it was all over the country and as I said under very difficult conditions. So it uh, over season all that meant we really had to repeat it exactly the same way uh, uh, at different times, but we don't really expect uh, much variation because actually uh, in most cases, if you measure on the land surface where you would expect seasonal influences or wind speed, we didn't measure much anyway. It was only when you went a meter deeper that you could measure. And a meter deeper, I do not expect effect of seasonal or wind speed, no. Um, another question, again, it's a, excuse, a two-part question, but um, Paula Sophia Gitz, Gitz asks, um, she has two questions, I'm reading this first one in a moment. Um, she asks, how was the selection of the 29 yeah. wells done? Which key attributes right. um, did you so, take into account? Uh, first of all, as I said, these were buried gas uh, wells. Uh, one of them was an oil well buried oil well and they were distributed uh, all over the country and it was really not a major uh, criteria because we didn't have much information about them uh, one thing was that they had to be some older wells not very recently uh, so yeah because then you would expect anything reaching the land surface will take many years so that was it. Otherwise, it was just based on uh, distribution over the uh, no spe special um, uh, criterion. And may Thank I add, you. it didn't matter anyway. So, there are so many of them. We just wanted to have a sample and say, based on that, make some judgment on the percentage of leaking gas wells. So you mentioned that you measure, take your measurements actually below meter below the surface, and um, some again some questions around heterogeneity and how heterogeneity could come into play here. So later, ask um, you showed surface concentrations not really representative of real leakage. Is it due to the vertical heterogeneity of the soil? So oh yeah, yeah another no. explanation. Uh, for partly that. is because as the gas approaches, as, as we approach the land surface, gas will get oxidized. And uh, therefore, there would be uh, less and less, and especially near the surface where there is a lot more oxygen, gets oxidized completely. So you cannot uh, find it anymore. And of course, when it reaches the land surface, it mixes with the air a lot faster than below the land surface. So that's why you really cannot find it once again, these are we cannot find it above background concentration. In the air, we have something like two uh, ppb parts per billion on volumetric basis, and it's not above that. I must add, when I say we didn't make really measurement at one meter deep, it's not the exact wording. We put a borehole which was one meter deep. And then we put our static chamber on top of that borehole. 
So instead of putting it on top of, no. say, grass, we put on. So that means now we have the gas coming down from one meter deep much faster to our static chamber instead of taking a long time to reaching the surface by diffusion. Okay, thank you. So Kishan, again, on the, on the um, topic of measuring things from depths, Kishan Kumar asked, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. You showed methane concentrations, which are quite heterogeneous in, the, in depth. So a way to measure it through all the um, further depths all the way through to the reservoir. Yeah, <laughs> would be nice to do that. Uh, as I said, we uh, most of the data I talked about, they were all data that during the uh, construction of the uh, uh, boreholes, they were collected. Uh, we also went to some deeper boreholes and made measurements from the groundwater in those depths. So it was not along the borehole at the depth of the borehole. So yeah, most of these boreholes are cased all the way through. So there's really no way if there's an existing borehole we can get along the depth. Unless we put the borehole again and make, yeah, then it's possible. But that was not in our uh, possibility. So if, you know, there's so many questions. Um, they're coming fast and I can think how to group them. So apologies for getting stuck for, for a moment here or two. Um, just trying to find those really interesting questions. So again, so two related questions. One is by Geoff Zimmel. Um, is there a remote sensing technique that may see vegetation health decline as a proxy indicator of methane leakage around where it was? A uh, good question. I must say I'm not aware of uh, vegetation cases that vegetation health has been compromised by the CH4. Um, in the case of uh, two cases that we found very high concentration, one of them the leaking gas, the other one the blowout site, the vegetation were in good shape. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had a photo or, a, or the image of the vegetation. Uh, so I wonder, maybe this kind of vegetation, which is mainly pasture in the Netherlands, probably not sensitive. I'm sure there would be some vegetation that would be sensitive. Mm -hmm. But that would be a good thing, yeah. But yeah, uh, how would you say from the health of the vegetation by remote sensing, is it because of CH4 or many other factors that could affect the health of vegetation? So uh, like really water, I don't know, lack of nutrients, many other things. So related to this, um, Juka asked, um, can GIS data help in gathering um, for the, these kind of measurements or not? For example, um, in Iran, with frequent natural gas leakage, how could we manage this? So what kind of remote, what kind of surface measurements database could you construct to, to identify gas leakage? Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I would say uh, you sh where you have uh, suspected areas of gas leakage. Now, if it is so much that it can be really uh, measured at the surface, that's easy. As I said, there are, actually, I didn't say that, there are cases in the Netherlands uh, where gas used to come to the surface. And in, I'm sure, I know in Iran is also the case. Yeah, those are fish, fissures and faults that are linked directly to the reservoir. Those are not the cases. Leaky gas wells, I do not believe you have major, uh, huge amount of gas coming up. The kind of concentrations we saw, and those really have to then observe putting in a borehole of a meter deep or so to be able to observe it. What you do about it, uh, yeah, uh, depending on where the leakage is. Uh, in the case of a uh, monster in Holland, they found out that it was actually at the gas wellhead that was covered, the leakage occurring. So they could repair it. But if it is that deep down there, a few hundred meters or thousand meters deep down there, yeah, the only way would be to open the, uh, the, the remove the wellhead and then pour cement down there where, somewhere. I, I wouldn't be able to tell. So 
staying on the topic of leakage, uh, Mokdamas, um, thank you for the great talk. I was wondering if you could comment on the potential source of the leakage. Is it the target formation or shallow source? And we have a comment from China here. It's, um, also, thank, it's along the same lines. Thanking you for the interesting talk. How can we differentiate the gases from the gas well or from other sources? So, how can we? What do we know yeah, about the source of the leakage? I did have a slide about that. Explain that gases from shallow uh, and even say deeper groundwater, let's say up to a few hundred meters, is a biogenic gas. And you can tell from its isotopic composition. Um, but the gas that is from deep down there, gas was uh, thermogenic. So from composition, you can tell if I understand the question correctly. Yeah. So it's compositional. Right. So um, another question from Paula to ask, would you assume that the casing shoes are more likely to present leakages in the decommissioned wells? Yeah, that is uh, definitely one possibility, and I believe that was the case in Monster. That's how they were able to repair it. Uh, but so that's, I would say, if a proper decommissioning is done, that's the easiest part to make sure it's really good and tight uh, uh, the capping put on it. Uh, but yeah, we human, we are a human being. We do not do always our job well, so it could be there. But I would expect that, and I know in cases that there were uh, explosions like in uh, Colorado, I believe, and uh, in the US, a couple of places, it was coming from deep down, the gas. So that means it was far deeper. Especially old gas wells where the, the quality of the material uh, has deteriorated over a long time. Could be from deep down. Just thinking about some, keeping an eye on the time as well. Um, a couple of questions on the modeling that I want to come to quickly. And then there's a really nice um, question I want to close with. But it's just sort of something that's slightly perhaps out of the left field. Anke Dahlman asks, um, Thank you for the nice talk. There are also many abandoned boreholes in the North Sea. How do you measure leakage there? So what do we do if you're offshore, which is... Very good question. Uh, yeah, I would say there, in principle, uh, would be the same as here. Uh, go around the uh, borehole uh, wellhead, make measurements of concentration of CH4 in the water around it, and uh, at the bottom of the sea, and then on the borehole wellhead itself. Uh, but what the exact instrumentation would be, I really don't have any idea. But you need to make measurements around the wellhead. If you can't see any other way. Coming to the modeling for a couple of questions. Um, LF Young. Apologies that I don't know the first name. Um, again, thanking you for the talk. So I see a lot of boreholes in the map are close to each other. I wonder how this effect of adding more sources of gas leakage from more than one well is impacting modeling results. I really don't think so. The boreholes are as close to each other to be uh, significant. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you can see my screen. If you don't, it doesn't matter. I was going to look what is the size of the domain that we took was about 120 meter lateral size uh, because beyond that uh, either the gas uh, unless it is in huge amounts either the gas will be oxidized and reduced in concentration or it will reach the atmosphere will go out so i don't think there would be boreholes of 120 meter close to each other at least i don't know of those, those cases. So they will not be uh, having accumulating effect on each other. And staying on the modeling topic, um, Soren asks, um, are there, um, about the model, are the fronts always and everywhere moving to the surface? Can we use equilibrium models, e.g. PCS curves? Do we need to worry about hysteretic effects? 
uh, well, the, the gas is always rising up almost vertically unless you have, but even when you have large groundwater velocity, gas rises up. Um, but the uh, dissolved gas front, it goes with the groundwater. So it really goes laterally. So it does go up to the surface, but whether it will reach it or not, this is a function of the gas flux and the groundwater velocity. And that is, of course, controlled by, for example, if you have low permeable layers, it will not reach probably. Um, what was the second part? The, um, the PCS curve. Do we need to oh, think about yeah. hysteretic yeah. effects? Non-equilibrium effects. It's not going to be huge, fast changes. And um, yeah, so I would say the regular PCS curve would be enough. Whether we, whether we have hysteresis, yeah, as long as the gas keeps on coming, I wouldn't expect hysteresis effects. Uh, but if the gas stops after some time, yeah, but I don't expect that. No, I wouldn't be worried about that. I'm going to take one final question because we're running out of time and then I'm going to hand over to Hardy for some closing comments. I thought, personally, I really like that question from Yuan Wang. So, um, sorry, that's the wrong one. This one said, are we interested in hydrogen storage? How could we, um, what could we learn from the methane leakage studies to understand and predict the effectiveness of hydrogen storage? Is there anything we can learn from that study, any knowledge we can transfer? Right. Well, uh, hydrogen storage, uh, one option is to store it in depleted gas reservoir. So basically the same issues uh, could be valid here. That means if there are, and I expect to be, have lots of abundant gas wells, then you really need to have a monitoring uh, system when you have H2 storage. You really must have monitoring system in place around all buried gas wells at the depth of a meter at least to have monitoring concentration of uh, hydrogen. Uh, and uh, in the, yeah, uh, if there are, Currently, uh, there are uh, gas wells being abandoned, being decommissioned. Then this must be done with utmost uh, care to make sure that it's really properly, adequately shut down. Because that's what is happening in Holland, that they are nowadays uh, trying to decommission most of the gas production facilities in the Netherlands. So they should really make sure that these are done as good as possible with the best technology. Yeah. Thank you very much, Majid. Hadi, over to you for some final questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, th that was quite a lively discussion. And that was uh, uh, just uh, thanks a lot to the uh, great audience we have and Majid and Sebastian both, of course. Uh, so I would like to take the chance to announce two things. One is that the Interpol conference next year will be at uh, Heriot, what will host, but it will be in Edinburgh. So we spoke about Interpol, so that's the time that now organizing committee is quite busy with that. The second is the announcement for the conference, uh, Hadi. It will be hybrid conference. Hybrid Hope conference. Okay. That means we... hopefully we can get together physically, but still for those who cannot attend for any reason, well, uh, and online. Yes, sure. That would be great, in fact, to allow others who may not be able to attend just to connect, and and uh, that would be really nice. So thanks a lot. Uh, I guess Sebastian is also in the organizing committee as well, yeah, so that. Good. And the second announcement I have is the next speaker. Uh, we are pleased to host next week uh, Dr. Cortes Oldenburg from Lawrence Livable uh, Berkeley. Sorry, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California. Uh, Gert will uh, speak about mechanistic modeling of CO2 leakage into the water column from offshore CO2 wells or pipelines. So stay tuned, happy, healthy until next week. We see you all. Uh, again at the same time, 4 p.m. CET, Central European time. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you, Hadi. Thank, Thank you.